a surprise sleeper hit released late in the summer of 1999, would later become a cult classic. We're discussing Brad Bird's The Iron Giant, coming up. Hello animation fans, Animator Talk here to celebrate the art of animation and its contribution to entertainment of yesterday, today, and into the future. Do you remember the magic of the summer of 1999 in the movie theaters? Well, I sure do. My wallet was always empty. George Lucas would give us the first of his prequel trilogy, Star Wars The Phantom Menace. Austin Powers would enjoy his first sequel with The Spy Who Shagged Me. Adam Sandler would give us Big Daddy, while Brendan Fraser would tangle with The Mummy. And Walt Disney Feature Animation would release their mega-hit Tarzan. The summer movie season usually starts off with a bang, then peters out to repeated viewings in a very quiet back nine. So it was very curious to me when Warner Brothers Feature Animation would release Brad Bird's theatrical debut, The Iron Giant, in early August. Two nights ago, a SATCOM radar detected an unidentified object entering Earth's atmosphere. Invaders from Mars! Some assumed it was a large meteor or a downed satellite. This is no meteor, gentlemen. <laughs> This is something much more dangerous. So, I guess you're not gonna hurt me, huh? This is unbelievable. This is the greatest discovery since television or something! Hey, big metal guy! I got food here for you! Oh my own giant robot, I am now the luckiest kid in America! Banzai! <laughs> Hey there, Scout. Kent Mansley. I work for the government. Now, why would you tell your mom about a giant robot? Mom! Ah, no privacy! Sorry. What are you talking about? Where's the giant? For some reason, the army is in our front yard, Mr. Mansley. We must stop it at all costs. Go to Code Red! Repeat, Code Red! We've got to help him! Hogarth, no! We gotta hide! Hey, stop! There's a kid in his hand! You can't protect him, Hogarth. Run! Warner Brothers Family Entertainment presents... Hogarth. The story of a young boy... Look out for the boss! <laughs> ...and a giant from another world... You can fly? ...who became a hero on this one. You can fly! The Iron Giant. Based on the 1968 novel, The Iron Man, by Ted Hughes, Brad Bird was given his first chance at directing a theatrical film for Warner Brothers. The story was set in a sleepy coastal town in Maine in 1957 during the Cold War. It stars a young boy named Hogarth Hughes who discovers a giant robot who seemingly comes from another planet. Once the boy and the robot become friends, it becomes apparent to Hogarth that he has to hide the robot from the U.S. military who comes looking for it. Now, Brad Bird is best known today as the creator and director of The Family Dog, The Incredibles films, Ratatouille, and of course, The Iron Giant. But back in the day, Brad had a hard time finding his footing in the industry. Having scored a first ever internship at the Walt Disney Studios, then hired on, he found it very discouraging to find that the studio didn't work in the ways it seemed to when Walt Disney roamed the halls. He fought for good ideas and his chance to shine. He didn't want him to outshine others and he, they didn't care for his outgoing nature, which he found very frustrating. He was let go from the studio and looked for other opportunities to break in. Then, one day, he received terrible news of a family tragedy. 
His sister had been killed by her husband at gun violence. It rocked the family, and Brad took it especially hard. Brad would then get to work on television shows like The Amazing Stories, where the Family Dog cartoon was aired. He worked on shows like The Simpsons, The Critic, and The King of the Hill before leaving to join the Turner Broadcasting Network to work on feature animation. He had been working on a feature film called Ray Gunn when Turner was acquired by Warner Brothers, who then soon canceled his project. Realizing what a talent they had in Bird, they set up a meeting with him to secure his spot. They asked of the projects they had in early development, which would he be interested in working on. He saw an illustration of a small boy and a giant robot. He saw the title The Iron Man and was told it was based on a book and was being made into a musical. He went home to think about his next move, and on his way home, he picked up the book. Brad enjoyed the Iron Man book very much and could see the potential in telling this story, providing they allow him some editorial changes. But it was the reason for the book that really intrigued Brad. Ted Hughes wrote these stories as a way of entertaining his children who were dealing with the tragic loss of their mother who had committed suicide when they were very young. Brad found some commonality with the author and immediately knew what his take of the story should be. Brad saw this story taking place in New England during the 1950s. During the space race and Russian fear and Sputnik, he saw this giant robot from outer space as a sympathetic character, which was designed for war but wanted peace. Brad used his memory of his family tragedy and pitched the film with, what if a gun had a soul and didn't want to be a gun? And he got the directorial gig. Once Brad was named director, he brought a friend and colleague, Tony Fuccelli, as animation director. Fuccelli had worked with Brad a few times prior, being a supervising animator on Brad's first directing gig, The Family Dog, and continues to work with him today. To sell the growing relationship between Hogarth and the robot, it was treated as you would a young boy who's found a stray puppy. And the more and more the boy tries to keep the dog from following him, the dog desires to follow all the more. Getting tangled in electrical wires, his memory gets wiped clean. Forgetting his primary functions that we later learn are that of a war machine. Hogarth attempts to train the robot to act in the least menacing way possible given his size which brings a lot of fun hijinks to the story. As with most extraterrestrial films, the U.S. government discovers there's a potential threat nearby and becomes the villain of the film, as they hunt down and attempt to capture the visitor. This film would be treated no differently. Enter Kent Mansley, an agent of the government, though I don't believe it's ever really identified as to what position he actually holds. He struts around town as if he's something of importance until he calls in the possibility of a sighting. It's clear the general doesn't think much of him or his reputation. The real fun comes when he discovers Hogarth may be the only one who can answer his questions. Hogarth then learns he needs a safe place to keep his friend and remembers an eccentric beatnik artist in town who lives in a local metal yard. Dean recycles junk into large metal sculptures, making his metal yard the perfect spot for this robot. Now, the voice cast for this film is pretty impressive. Then 15-year-old Eli Marienthal would voice Hogarth, while Harry Connick Jr. would play Dean, the beatnik confidant whom Hogarth could trust with his secret friend. Friends fame Jennifer Aniston would voice Hogarth's mother, Annie, while federal agent Kent Mansley was voiced perfectly by Shooter McGavin himself, Christopher McDonald, and General Rogard was portrayed by John Mahoney of Fraser fame. The unique role of the Iron Giant himself would require a massive vocal presence. Vin Diesel was cast to voice the vocal sound effects for the robot. They would heavily filter his performance so much to give it that huge, unearthly quality. So glad they never needed to filter his voice after that. I'm rude. Oh, right. Huh. 
Now, the animation of the robot is interesting. By 1999, computer animated characters were hardly new. Believe it or not, the robot is a complete CGI creation animated on twos, or animated at 12 frames per second, to match the characters in the scenes. A program was created to give the solid outlines to every facet and detail of the character. But as an extra special feature, technicians of the studio devised a special program that would alter the line work to be imperfect, thus blending in with the hand-drawn characters it he interacts with. Anyone who knows me at all knows how much I love all forms of animation. The illusion of life, when successfully executed, is a beautiful thing to watch on screen. Whether it's a traditionally drawn character, done with puppets in stop motion, or today's CGI, it's an art form that not everybody can pull off. As much as I love the better CGI films of today, Nothing will ever be as good as traditionally animated films like this. I can be quite prejudiced when reviewing animated films. There's a reason why I hold Disney in such high esteem. Nobody does animation like the Walt Disney Studios. However, this film was animated so beautifully, it's my favorite non-Disney animated feature of all time. Sure, The Secret of Nim and The American Tale are beautifully pulled off, but for my money, Brad Bird's The Iron Giant is the most beautiful animated feature to ever come from a non-Disney studio. Take, for instance, the scene where Hogarth suits up and heads out to investigate the loud noise out in the nearby forest. He straps on a flashlight to a BB gun and heads out into the darkness. Every bit of attention to detail was paid in the lighting effects of this scene. Melding two different background paintings lined up perfectly so that the only light you would see would be coming from the flashlight or backlit from the night sky. I've never seen this done to this effect in any other animation ever. It's genius. There was also a terrific bit of symbolism once the robot discovers an old action comic book featuring the first issue of Superman. Hogarth explains the symbolism of the superhero, and it seemed to resonate with our robot. At first, he finds a metal-formed S in the junk piles. But once he takes this lesson in internally, he discovers his inner superhero. Oh, hey! Did you know? Check it out! This film was originally thought of as a musical. In 1989, Pete Townsend of The Who fame had co-written a musical inspired by the book The Iron Man. The film was originally planned around that musical. The film takes place in 1957, which is the same year Brad Bird was born. In the sequence where the police are investigating the train crash scene, there are two Disney legends who pop out for a quick cameo. Ollie Johnston and Frank Thomas portray the engineers of the train. In real life, Ollie Johnston was one train enthusiast who would encourage Walt Disney to build his own train in his backyard, just like he did. The sleepy little coastal town where this story takes place is called Rockwell, Maine. Rockwell is named after one of my favorite illustrators, Norman Rockwell. This art director would take his artistic inspiration from Norman Rockwell for the look of this film. The Iron Giant was released on August 6th of 1999. It only pulled in $23 million domestically and $31.3 million worldwide. In my opinion, the poor performance in the theaters was absolutely due to a poor marketing campaign. The poor performance of Warner Brothers' previous film, The Quest for Camelot, made the studio executives very nervous, which caused them to miss the film that was right there in front of them. Warner Brothers didn't know what they had here. Every film to be released into theaters first goes before a test screening audience. The executives would observe the audience's reception and ask questions after the film was over. 
the multiple test screenings for this film scored the highest in 15 years at Warner Brothers. They didn't bother giving Brad Bird any notice of a release date until April once they saw these results. If the film had been properly advertised, I have no doubt more people would have purchased tickets. Several companies showed interest in merchandising this film, such as toy manufacturers and Burger King. However, once they were told they only had four months until release, they all backed out of deals, as toy production usually takes a good year to get into production. Theatrically, it was a failure. But critically, well, that's another story. The critics fell all over themselves over this film. Positive reviews all around. Today's Rotten Tomatoes still holds an approval rating of 96%. Roger Ebert had once written, It feels like a classic, even though it's just out of the box. This film would go on to win the Annie Award for Best Animated Feature, beating out the mighty Tarzan. It earned several outstanding individual achievement awards for effects animation and direction, uh, writing for an animated feature. It would also go on to win the BAFTA Children's Award for Best Animated Feature. Warner Brothers would learn their lesson on their poor marketing campaign, and they would revamp it for advertising for their home video release. By November of 1999, The Iron Giant was advertised almost everywhere and became a cult hit following immediately after its video's release. Television broadcast rights were snagged up by Cartoon Network and TNT in 2000. Cartoon Network would actually end up airing this film for 24 consecutive hours on Thanksgiving Day and the 4th of July that year. The Iron Giant was a pleasant surprise coming from Warner Brothers Animation. At a time where the studio was focusing more on television animation and pushing out home video re-releases of old Looney Tunes cartoons, trying to revive Scooby-Doo's franchise for the hundredth time, and of course, 1999 was that apprehensive year where a Land Before Time sequel wasn't being forced down children's throats. The Iron Giant was like Christmas had come early. I urge you to pop it back into your DVD player and give it another viewing. Until next time, you keep moving forward. Mm -hmm.